Simos. Thank you very much for the kind introduction and thanks everyone for being here today. So today I will briefly discuss our recent results on uh, ground state properties and dynamics of uh, dipolar Bose-Einstein condensates when exposed to a rotating magnetic field. So before starting my presentation, let me first say a few words about uh, my research directions in the last few years. So a major focus of my research is devoted to, the, to study the dynamics of quantum antibody systems, aiming in particular to reveal correlation induced phenomena and entanglement based processes. Let me uh, first, uh, let me also uh, <clears throat> mention some of uh, the research directions that I'm currently pursuing and a priori also heartfully thank all of the collaborators uh, in all the individual progress, uh, projects, sorry, <laughs> projects uh, for their tremendous contributions and for bearing, of course, with me. So, uh, I think it doesn't work. Yes. <laughs> Now it's working, thank you. <laughs> so first of all, I would like to mention a collaboration with the University of Amherst and Lund University on long range interacting systems, uh, where we're trying to, uh, uh, cre to create uh, quantum states of matters, uh, matter due to quantum fluctuations and study the dynamics of these uh, systems and especially using these uh, states with quantum fluctuations for applications. Then, in another context, uh, in a collaboration with the University of Hamburg, the Munich University, and the IST Austria, we study quasi particle physics. Uh, and lately, we're focusing on magnetic uh, <coughs> quasi particles uh, with uh, a particular focus on trying to uh, uh, <coughs> control the spin wave excitations with impuric states. Then I would like also to mention two collaborations here, which I'm honored to have with Vasil Rokai and Serendad in here at ITAM, where with Vasilis, Vasilis we study polariton physics, constructing effective Hamiltonian to understand induced interactions of these quasi particles and the correlation effects stemming from the light matter field. While with Jeren, we're trying to, ev to evince signatures of uh, many body chaos in quantum many body systems and uh, understand these, uh, pro the properties of these systems for multi component spin or Einstein condensates. Finally, turning to the experimental side, I have a collaboration with uh, Peter Engels' group at Washington State University, where we study the dynamics of nonlinear excitations, and soon we will report on the first observation of robust dark bright solid uh, lattices. And uh, we are suggesting that there are different regimes in these dynamics, and uh, there is a possibility to emulate super solid structures now with short range interactions and not with long range ones. And finally, I would like to mention a collaboration with Yai Yun Choi from KAIST, where we study the universal dynamics of spinner Einstein condensates and also try to understand the emergent topological pattern formations in these systems. Okay, so let me start uh, with the topic of this uh, talk. So I will talk about dipolar Bose-Einstein condensate. So dipolar quantum gases commonly <clears throat> consist in experiment either of erbium or uh, dysprosium atoms and offer ideal platforms for probing effects of quantum fluctuations. It is the interplay between short-range contact interactions and long-range ones that give rise to various uh, quantum phenomena, such as an isotropic superfluidity, the formation of self-bound uh, uh, droplet states, or the peculiar supersolid state of matter. Supersolids have been uh, very recently observed in a series of experiments, and they stem from the two low frequency compressional modes of the dipolar Einstein condensate. Uh, <clears throat> they offer an interesting manifestation of the quantum superposition in a sense that they combine both the frictionless flow of a superfluid and they have also the crystal arrangement of a solid. Turning back to dipolar Bose-Einstein condensate, I have to say that the different states that appear in uh, these systems, they are inherently related to roton excitations and specifically it is the phenomenon of the roton softening 
occurring for strong, attractive dipolar interactions that drive the system into a collapse. Here, quantum fluctuations will come as a savior and uh, act repulsively, preventing uh, this process and offering a stabilization mechanism. To first order, these quantum fluctuations can be modeled by the Lindemann-Yang correction term, and this leads to extended cross pitayevsky frameworks. If within this context, uh, the system has been argued to accommodate uh, self-bound states such as droplets or supersolids, and the, it has been shown that their arrangement depends crucially on the transversal direction. Now, let me also mention in passing that uh, these droplet states have been independently, can be independently maybe created in short range interacting mixtures. And uh, <clears throat> they have been also very recently observed in both homonuclear and heteronuclear three dimensional atomic bosonic mixtures. However, a, a central problem that uh, is always there for self bound states is that they suffer from three body, uh, uh, three body inelastic collisions, which prevents their long time observation in the experiment. Okay. So to summarize, let me also mention that the majority of the current investigations in the polar Bose-Einstein condensates have been devoted to the situation where the magnetic field that aligns the dipoles are, is aligned along the Z axis. However, uh, Yes, and in order to pass from one phase to the other, one has to use Fesbach, uh, Fesbach resonances for tuning the S-wave interaction. However, there will be another possibility, and this is to consider a rotating magnetic field, which essentially provides an additional knob now to manipulate the, both the magnitude and the sign of the dipolar, uh, dipolar interactions. And this can be uh, proven, as I will try to argue, very fruitful also uh, in order to exploiting, let's say, the anisotropy of the dipolar interactions to, pile, to cross from one phase to the other, to create different phases. So it will affect the bound state formation. I will try to argue that it will also affect the self-evaporation process of uh, the self-bound states. And another very ni <clears throat> another nice direction that one would follow, and I will try also to discuss a little bit about that today, would be to monitor now the dynamical nucleation of these structures. I, uh, for instance, by crossing the relevant phase boundaries and uh, see the deformations of the states. And here, it will be important to see metastable states of the system that you cannot have in a ground state configuration, and also uh, inspect whether there will be differences between dynamically stable states as compared to the ground states of the system. Okay. So this brings me to the outline of my talk. So first I will discuss the bipolar setup under consideration. Then I will move and uh, describe the phase diagram of the system and briefly describe the corresponding beyond mean field states that arise. Subsequently, I will move and uh, elaborate on the spontaneous nucleations of supersolid clusters and droplet lattices. And finally, I will try to argue that this rotating, the consideration of this rotating magnetic field might facilitate the prolongation of lifetime of the object. Okay. So first of all, uh, these are the two setups that we will consider, both quasi 1D and quasi 2D. Here <clears throat> are the dipoles. And uh, we have a rotating magnetic field having an, a tilt angle phi with the z axis. Yeah. So uh, the, commonly, this will be this is the dipolar dipole dipole uh, interaction potential. It it is anisotropic due to this term denominator and also a long range due to the r to the q uh, scaling in the denominator. The dipoles in our case will be aligned al along this uh, unit vector, which contains the angle phi of the magnetic field with the z-axis and also the angular frequency of the magnetic field, which will be considered here larger than the trap frequency and smaller than the uh, Larmor precision frequency, such that the dipoles can follow the rotation of the field. Okay. Before uh, starting with this potential, let me uh, mention before that, that in the absence of the rotation, so when we have omega equals zero, we can uh, distinguish two cases of the dipoles. First, the alignment of the field is uh, parallel to the, uh, 
dipoles, and this will lead to a head tail arrangement and attractive dipole dipole interaction. And in the opposite case, where we have a perpendicular uh, arrangement, we will have a side by side distribution of the end and repulsive dipole and potential. Okay. So, since I will consider a rotating magnetic field, it makes sense to have, especially for the ground states of the system that I will discuss, a time average uh, over a full rotating cycle. I can we can calculate this, and this is the expression that gives the interaction potential. And here we have to be very careful and uh, see that, first of all, there is a so called magic angle where the dipole dipole interaction potential vanishes. And then we have to distinguish between two regimes. First, below and above this magic angle. As long as we are, as we, as long as we lie below the magic angle and we increase the tilt angle of the rotating magnetic field, then the dipole-dipole potential will be on average repulsive, and each magnitude will decrease. Then, turning to the other region where we are above this magic angle, and we start again increase the uh, tilt angle. Then, the, uh, on average, now the dipole dipole potential will be attractive and each magnitude will start to increase. Okay, okay so in order <clears throat> for uh, the, the description of both the ground state and the dynamics that I will uh, tell you uh, now, we will use an extent Kospitevsky framework. This is the equation that we simulate essentially, it contains a three dimensional a harmonic oscillator potential, the S wave scattering length here, the dipole dipole anisotropic and long range potential, and also the beyond mean field LHY contribution. Okay, we will consider both quasi 1D and quasi 2D regimes. This will be the trapping frequencies taken from the experiments of Erlano, and we will have dysprosium atoms having this magnetic moment and this dipole moment. So, uh, in order now to uh, start investigating the ground state properties of the system, we will consider variations of the S-wave interaction and the particle number. Here you see in these four panels, four different phase diagrams of this system. Uh, in the color bar, the chemical potential is depicted, which um, is related to the energy of the system. And <clears throat> Uh, before starting, and you see the phase diagrams as a function of the S wave scattering length and the particle number of the system. So, before starting uh, describing these phases, let me uh, say that, of course, we don't just the, and identify the states that appear here in terms of the chemical potential. We have uh, we inspect both the density distributions, the momentum distributions, and also the wave functions, uh, the phases of the wave functions. Okay, so first of all, let's forget about all of these uh, panels and concentrate on the first one. This corresponds to the situation where we have an aligned magnetic field along the Z direction. What we see is that, and this is the situation that has been considered in the literature so far. So <clears throat> we see that for large S wave interaction, we have a superfluid state. Then by starting decreasing the S wave interaction, we enter and in the vicinity of zero chemical potential, which is marked here by the dust white line, we see a super solid state. And further decreasing the S wave interaction, we can enter either a single droplet regime or the multiple droplet regime. This multiple droplet regime has also been referred to the literature as insulating uh, droplet regime. Okay, so we have these different four phases, and as long as we increase the tilt angle, but lying below the magic angle, what we see is that the, the super solid region and the multiple droplet region start to shrink, and this is because the dipole dipole potential effectively decreases in magnitude. At the corresponding magic angle, which I do not depict here, the dipole dipole potential will vanish. So we will have just a superfluid state all over. And then by starting increasing the tilt angle here and here, for instance, what we see is that only the single droplet region and the superfluid will persist in the system. Okay, so in order now to visualize these states and give you a hint, here I depict density profiles in the XZ plane and XY plane. Let's focus on the XY for now and uh, for different uh, S wave interactions. So, what we see is that for large S wave interaction, the density of the system is just a smooth two dimensional Thomas frame profile. This is 
normal superfluid, then we start decrease uh, the S wave interaction and the density gets modulated and uh, density humps appear, which are weakly linked between each other. This is a sign of super solidity. And as we decrease further the S wave interaction, we enter the uh, droplet regime, which here corresponds to a, a square crystal arrangement. Okay. Then let me also mention that, as I said before, with uh, tuning the angle of the magnetic field, we can effectively manipulate the magnitude and the sign of the dipole-dipole uh, interaction. And here I depict essentially three different cases with the same particle number and test wave interaction, where we can see that we can go, we can, for instance, transform the system from a, a triangular almost configuration all the way to the honeycomb lattice configuration of droplets. Okay, having now discussed the ground state properties of the system, I will go and move towards the dynamics. So what I will uh, do is initialize the system in a superfluid state and then uh, perform a quench of the S-wave interaction in order to cross the phase boundaries towards the super solid or the droplet region. And A, my aim is to characterize these structures in terms of so also of their coherence losses and also afterwards include three body recombination processes and see what is their impact. So here, what happened? We finished. <laughs> yeah. so, <laughs> so here you see density snapshots uh, of uh, a two-dimensional dipolar Bose-Einstein condensates for different time instants, starting from a superfluid with a, um, a Thomas Fermi density profile and quenching towards the super solid, towards the super solid regime. We see that at short time scales, ring-like patterns appear. This is a manifestation of the roton instability and this particular the radial roton. As time evolves, these um, these rings start to uh, interfere. And also you see that there is a magnification of the azimuthal undulation of the cloud. This is a signature that higher lying also roton modes, the so-called angular rotons participate in the dynamics and finally ultimately result in a super solid cluster. Okay. Just to <clears throat> mention here, also here I depict the wave function for the super solid and for the super fluid. You see that for the super fluid, the density is homogeneous all over, while for the super fluid, super solid, sorry, you have undulations. You have the appearance of undulations in the phase of the wave function. Yeah, this is another way to distinguish these phases. Then here you see density snapshots when quenching from a superfluid state towards now the droplet regime. What you see is again the ring-like ring excitations which appear faster this time because we go deeper into the droplet regime. So the growth rate of the instability becomes larger. Then this instability uh, causes also the breakup of the individual rings. This is the admixture of higher line rotten modes. And then this procedure results into the nucleation, the dynamical nucleation of a droplet cluster, which in the long time dynamics becomes also a stationary configuration. Okay. And just to let you know, the same phenomenology also occurs in the quasi 1D regime. So here you see the dynamics, density snapshots for an elongated dipolar Bose-Einstein condensate. We start from an elongated 1D Thomas Fair profile. We have the nucleation of elliptic halos due to rotten modes, and these essentially afterwards break up into an droplet array, which again becomes stationary in the long time revolution. Okay. Now, uh, after showing all uh, these density patterns, let me also say a few words about the coherence losses in the system. So in order to judge about the coherence losses, we uh, employ this uh, function, this global phase coherence, which is just the, the instantaneous phase of the system minus the integrated, the specially integrated one at each time instant. And all this is weighted by the density of the system. So for a, for a normal superfluid, mean field, yeah, this quantity is by definition zero. So now we see during the quench dynamics, this is the quantity during the quench dynamics that we show for three different quenches. This, 
the green line corresponds to ones within the superfluid, the orange within the supersolid, and the uh, blue within the droplet regime. Dust lines here refer to quenches. Uh, sorry, solid lines here refer to quenches. Dust lines re uh, refer to time-dependent adiabatic grams of the S-wave interaction. And I will tell you why. So, first of all, uh, considering just the quenches, we see that uh, both in the superfluid and in the supersolid regime, we have a finite amount of coherence, global phase coherence during the dynamics. And coherence is completely lost for the droplet. Yeah? However, I told you before that global phase coherence should be maintained in the supersolid. And this is not happening here due to the quench. The quench gives rise to a variety of excitations in the system, and then global phase coherence is not maintained. You can maintain the global phase coherence by following an adiabatic ramp of the system. And this is what I'm showing here with the dust lines, where you see both the green and the orange lines are uh, much less suppressed than the quench scenario. However, coherence again is completely lost for the droplet lines. So I was going to yeah. ask you about this. Uh, maybe instead of global phase coherence, uh, you could call it global phase recoherence because Ah, yes. Yeah, yeah, I took this from a paper of Erlaino, essentially, and they call it global phase coherence. That's why I use this terminology not to change it. Yes, yes, but you're right, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes, please. Maybe about the connection with this with uh, coherence and the superfluid fraction. So if you include it, uh, maybe one to one, maybe you care. Ah, this is true. This is true. Yes, yes. So, so if you could do it, it would be nice to see how this is the border or, or essentially destroy the superfluid. Exactly. Yes. No, no, this is a good suggestion. Yes, yes. But uh, we have not done this, oh. speaking, but we can do that. Yes, yes. This is a good suggestion. And then let me also say about uh, the tunability of the droplet clusters. So both in quasi 1D and quasi 2D, as you see here, you see the amount of droplets that contained for different edge wave scattering lengths or fixed edge wave scattering and tuning the tilt angle. And in both cases, what we see is that the number of droplets is becomes larger as uh, we decrease the edge wave scattering length. This is natural. We go deeper into the droplet regime. The same will happen as you uh, as uh, you decrease the tilt angle because you increase the magnitude of uh, the dipole-dipole interaction. And the more the most interesting part here is that the number of nucleated vortices, uh, vortices uh, droplets during the dynamics in the in the stationary configuration is larger than in the ground state configuration. And this hints towards that there are some dynamically stable configurations which you cannot find in the ground state. Okay. And finally, I would like to mention a few, to say a few words about what is going on when it, what it will happen when you include the body recombination processes. So what we will do is to simulate the same cross pitayevsky equation up to here, but now include also this imaginary part, which emulates the, the three-body recombination phase. An important point here is that this parameter t, which scales with the dipolar length, is the one that uh, essentially determines the scaling of the three-body recombination uh, coefficient. And in the case of phi equals zero, that has been considered thus far in the literature, uh, the only way to enter the droplet regime is as long as you satisfy that the S wave scattering length is smaller than the dipolar length. And then the three body combination scales as deep as the following. However, here the, that we consider this rotating magnetic field, we can also create droplets in this regime where the S wave scattering length is larger than the dipolar length. And then it is known from this scattering paper here that the three body recombination scales as AS to the form. So what I will try to argue is that essentially this 
the scaling here facilitates the prolongation of the lifetime of droplets. Here I show you just uh, very briefly three different snapshots when you include three, uh, this three body recombination to, uh, for a quench toward the super solid and the droplet. You see that finally uh, you uh, again create these structures. However, these are lost soon after the formation. And here, in order to convince you about that, I show you the number of atoms during the dynamics for different field orientations and S-wave interactions. So focusing, first of all, in the case of phi equals zero, where you have an aligned magnetic field, and this is what has been considered so far in the literature, you see that for larger S-wave scattering lengths, the uh, lifetime of the droplet is large. Yeah. However, uh, the most important thing and the take home message from here is that uh, you should focus on this, this uh, lower panel here, where we have a fixed S wave scattering length and we tune the angle of the rotating magnetic field. And this shows you that for larger angles of the rotating magnetic field, then the uh, lifetime of the droplets is to some extent at least larger. Yeah. Okay. That was it. So this brings me to the outlook. So we have extracted the phase diagram of the polar Bose-Einstein condensates in both quasi 1D and quasi two-dimensional settings using uh, a rotating magnet, an external rotating magnetic field. We have identified the various uh, quantum phases, such as superfluid, supersolid, single droplets, and multiple droplet regimes. We have shown that uh, one can really manipulate the configurations that you find by tilting the angle of the rotating magnetic field. And this is in contrast, so you don't need as wave uh, Fesbach resonances uh, <clears throat> as it was done up to now in the literature. And also we have considered interaction quenches upon crossing the relevant phase boundaries shown the spontaneous nucleation of supersolid clusters and droplet lattices. We have argued about coherence losses and uh, also that by emulating three-body recombination processes with this rotating magnetic field, we can prolong the lifetime, at least to some extent, of droplets. With this, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Yes. Which one? Yes. So when you do the branch, uh, you can see the formation of these uh, clusters. Mm -hmm. uh, and you, you basically can estimate, you can estimate the resistance between them. Yes. Is it related to the... To the K, uh, yes, yes, exactly. Exactly. To the K vector of the lot of solid mode. So you can show, can you show that the, the actually the most unstable mode for uh, after the branch? I mean, I could show that, yes, by going also to the momentum distribution of the one body density, showing the growth of the rotor. Right? Okay. Yes. And then the, the question is, uh, suppose that you, uh, you release the trap, mm -hmm. then would this uh, drop start to repel each other? To, to ah, this we have not tried. This we have not tried. I was wondering if this type of phenomenology is similar to the solid nuclear formation mm -hmm. uh, when you go for the quench from uh, the past to the past with the... No, this uh, is a good question. We have not tried that, honestly speaking. Yes, we have not tried that. But this is... But the question is how stable is... Uh, exactly, yes. This... Exactly, exactly. Because, because this... Like single, at a single cluster level, it's okay. Mm. But then uh, what happens at the other level? Like no, this is very interesting. Yes, 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 yes. yes. And also regarding this k vector that you said, one could also go to and calculate the Bukovicov generalization spectrum exactly. and see the normal modes, and yeah. then perturb the selectivity also and see the effect impact. So for the droplet, it should be uh, n normal modes as the number of droplets. For the super solid, it's not that uh, evident. Of the 
Ah, this is has already done in the experiment for dipolar. Yeah, yeah. So this is fine. So maybe follow up that. Uh, what frequency can they actually rotate this disk by switching the decent time of some sort of the shadow thing? Yes, so here we operate in the regime that the uh, rotating, the angular frequency is larger than the trapped frequency, but smaller than the larmor precision frequency of the dipoles. Right. And this is also what has been done in the experiment. Okay. So this is... Uh, uh, typical numbers. So it depends. So let's see. So for instance, here you have like, uh, this is the one B, you have like, uh, yes, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you.